Hi everyone, welcome to our second lecture, uh, second week of lectures in CSE 114 during the summer of uh, 2018. Uh, we'll start with a few uh, notes about the, uh, the class. If you have any questions, please post them on the uh, SD Connect chat and the TAs will try to respond to the questions and collect those questions that they cannot respond to uh, for me uh, to respond. And uh, I will stop every 10-20 minutes to ask if there are any questions uh, that are not responded yet. We will start today with loops uh, and iteration in general and problems that require iteration. We will continue with methods, uh, how to write basically abstractions, uh, 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 names that correspond to a sequence of statements that get executed uh, with certain parameters when we uh, invoke a method. And if we have time, we'll actually start talking about arrays. Main, the main reason for that is that uh, they are very, uh, uh, loops are very useful for iterating through arrays. Any kind of algorithm that uh, requires arrays like linear search, uh, binary search for sorted arrays. Also, we are going to talk about uh, sorting algorithms like selection sort and insertion sort. So we are also going to implement all of these algorithms in today's lecture and, uh, and next class lecture. So let's start with uh, uh, loops and iteration. So we'll start with a motivating problem. Basically, why exactly do we need this concept of loops? And the answer is simple. Let's assume that we want to write a program where we ask a user to enter a positive integer, some uh, user-defined number of times n, that we want to print uh, a message like welcome to Java. When we write the code, we actually do not know what's the value of n. So we actually will need a, a certain if statements or maybe a switch statement and uh, different parts of the code that they are basically executed for printing welcome to Java 1, 2, 3, 10, 100 times and so on, which is obviously very inefficient and uh, the code is also very difficult to read and uh, write. The solution is to use a loop. And in this example, I'm using a while loop is the basic type of loop. The syntax of the while loop is very close to an if statement. You see that instead of the if keyword, we are using a while keyword. We check a condition if it's true. If that condition is true, we execute the body of that uh, specific loop. So in this case, let's assume that n is the integer that the user entered. The user could have entered, let's say, 18, some random positive number. Uh, we start with a variable count that is equal with uh, uh, zero. As long as count is strictly less than the value of n, we print out the message welcome to Java, we increment the count, and then we recheck the condition. So let's assume that the value that the user entered was 18. At this point, the count is one. One is still less than 18, and we print again welcome to Java, Again, we increment a uh, uh, condition with one and so on, the variable with one and so on. So what we can see is that it's a very close statement to the if statements with the exception that we have a, a, a loop or an iteration that, in fact, we do not exit the statement, the while statement, uh, after each iteration. We actually execute the while statement as long as the condition of the while statement is true. So what is iteration? It's basically, it's, if you look at any dictionary, pro logic, uh, uh, programming dictionary, you will see that iteration is defined as repeating a set of instructions a specified number of times or until a specific result is achieved, until some Boolean condition is true. So how do we repeat steps? We can take that previous example. Basically, we start executing the body of that loop, like instruction A, instruction B, and then instruction C could be a jump back to A, which basically requires now to execute again instruction A, instruction B, and so on. And original programs in assembly and machine language were really implementing this idea of a jump or a go-to statement that either conditionally based on some condition or unconditionally 
we jump the execution to another uh, specific part of the code. And uh, since higher level languages were uh, created to actually write code that uh, executes uh, very deterministically and we want to check if the, the conditions or the execution has certain properties, the type of, uh, of jumps actually changed. We don't have unconditional jumps, we don't have conditional jumps anymore, we actually have a higher level uh, iteration statements or loops. So why do we use iteration? Like in the previous example, the motivating example, because we want to make our code more efficient. And we want to make it practical to write basically complex programs that uh, may actually react to different values of the input from the user. We want to make our code more flexible. Let's assume that we, want, we don't want to uh, print the message n times. We want to print the message n plus one times or two n times. That basically will require just the change of the condition that we have in that while statement or uh, the limits or the range of a for loop. We don't have to actually add additional statements within the body of each one of the if statements if this was not actually using a loop. Also, it would make our code easier to change, so more dynamic. And as an example, we, change, we take a similar example. Let's assume that we want uh, to write a program that computes uh, n factorial for every integer, positive integer n, that is entered by the user. If the user enters 5, we would like to print the value of uh, 5 factorial. Similarly, if the user enters 10, we would like to print 10 factorial, and so on. Without iteration or recursion, we'll see later when we actually talk about methods, this would be very impractical. It basically, since we do not know n, we have to write a program that we check for each possible value of n. We read the integer uh, that was entered, n, and then if n is 0 or 1, factorial is 1. Else, if n is 2, then we compute 2 factorial. If n is 3, then we compute 3 factorial. If n is 4, we compute 4 factorial, and so on. And there are problems which basically they are inherently uh, uh, iter uh, iterative, or we actually need some kind of loops to compute them. So there are two issues in, in, in this program. The fact that we have any possible n value, and the fact that we are computing a product of uh, multiple values. We are basically iterating over the value of n and multiplying this factorial product with every value uh, between 1 and n. And as we can see, this is very inefficient. Basically, it requires us to write hard code uh, factorial for every value of n, uh, factorial of 10, factorial of 15, and so on. So what can we do? We can use loops. And Java has three types of loops uh, that we are going to use in this class. The first and the basic type of loop is actually a while loop. Everything else is actually written in terms of this while loop. So with iteration, the previous program that computes n factorial will be very easy to implement. After we read that integer, and let me actually correct, there is a typo, should, we should use the next int method. After we actually compute that, uh, we read that integer, we start with the original value of the product factorial equal with 1. We define a loop iteration uh, variable, basically a value that is the initial value that we multiply for factorial. And then we actually write the while loop. And the same, con the same rules that applies for if statements, that if we have a single statement that gets executed inside the while block, uh, for this uh, uh, while statement, we do not need actually to put a block. If we have multiple statements executed within the while block, then we need to put a begin curly brace for block and end curly brace. And that example is earlier when we actually had this loop that printed n times a message. Since we had two print statement, two statements, one print statement and one uh, increment statement, we actually needed a block. But if we have a single statement, we really don't need a block for defining the loop. So in this example, as long as i is less than or equal with n, 
the factorial is multiplied with the old value of i and we increment i with 1. So this uses a post increment that modifies both the original factor the factorial with original i and increments i with 1. So what happens let's say that I'm asking uh, the computer the program to print uh, 3 factorial. The user enters the value 3 for uh, the value of n. It starts with factorial equal with 1, i is equal with 1, 1 is less than equal with n. Factorial is multiplied with 1 and i is incremented with 1 to 2. 2 less than equal with n is still true. So factorial is multiplied with 2 and i is incremented to 3. 3 less than equal with n uh, is true because n was 3. Factorial is multiplied with 3. Factorial now becomes 6. And i is incremented to 4. 4 less than equal with 3 is false. We exit and we print the factorial, which is 6. So this is how we solve that previous problem that would require for any value of n to actually specify the product and have a separate uh, branch in these cascading if statements for the value of n, for every single specific value of n. So as I mentioned earlier, Java has three basic types of iterative statements. While loops. Then we have do while loops, which basically uh, do the check for the condition at the end of the do while loop. So we actually execute the block of the do while loop at least once, because we never check the, the condition at the beginning. And then we have for loops, which are uh, basically mostly used for counting or iterating over uh, the elements of an array or over the characters of a string and so on. In fact, the three types of loops do very similar things, which basically what it means is that they have the same complexity and expressivity. We can actually uh, represent any problem uh, in uh, any problem that can be represented with loops in any one of the three types of loops. So which one would we use? It's a basically a matter of individual preference, convenience. For instance, if we write an algorithm, that we know exactly how many steps we iterate over, we would use a for loop. If we write a menu that we want to be printed at least once, and then to give the user a choice if he continues the iteration or he exits, then we would use probably a do while loop because that would be useful for such menus. And finally, the while loops that check the condition at the beginning they can all be transformed from one type of loop to uh, the other two types of loops. And later we are actually are going to do that kind of loops. There is another kind of loops uh, called for each loops that was added in Java 1.5 and is very useful for iterating over the elements of a collection. We will see it later when we talk about arrays. At this point uh, in the class we do not have yet collections. But once we have collections, these are basically sets or uh, ordered sets for uh, of ordered bags of multiple elements, we can iterate over each one of the elements and either use their values for, let's say, the sum of the elements in the collection or actually modify their values. For those kind of uh, uh, problems, for each loops are most useful, uh, we are going to cover them next. Uh, lecture basically when we talk about arrays. So today we are going to talk mainly about while loops and then do while loops and for loops. And we'll start with while loops. We'll see both the uh, pseudocode for writing while loops and then examples with while loops. And we are also going to see in a flowchart what is actually the workflow. We execute the condition and then based on the condition we either execute the body of the loop or we actually exit that uh, loop statement. So here we have actually uh, the syntax of a loop statement and an example of using a loop to print not only like 10 times or 18 times, but actually 100 times one message. So uh, the basic way to write while loops is the following. While is a keyword in Java. It's followed by open parentheses and a Boolean condition. This has to evaluate to either true or false. This is called a loop continuation condition. 
if that condition is true, we execute the body of the loop, which is called the loop body, and the statements in that loop body, and then we come back and check the condition again. And we repeat this as long as the condition is true. The moment that the condition becomes false, we exit the while loop. In fact, if the condition is false at the beginning, at first time it's actually evaluated, we exit the, we exit the while loop without executing the body uh, not even once. So here is the flowchart, the workflow of how this gets executed. We start the program, we actually get to the point where we have this while loop. We execute, we actually evaluate the loop continuation condition, which is a Boolean condition. If that condition is true, then we execute the statement within the loop body. And then we return back to check again the loop continuation condition. If the loop continuation condition is false, then we exit the while loop without executing basically the loop body. And here we have an example. Let's assume that we want to write a program that prints welcome to Java 100 times. With what we learned up to now before loops, we will actually have to write 100 statements that uh, print welcome to Java, or actually one statement that contains new line characters uh, and 100 statements and 100 uh, substrings welcome to Java. But this is not actually how, it is, uh, how it's done in any programming language. We can actually use a loop. As long as the count is strictly less than 100, we started with 0. So this will be true for 0, for 1, up to 99, so 100 times. When it gets to 100, the count is 100 less than 100 is false, and we exit without printing welcome to Java. So we translate exactly the flowchart that uh, we had for the general case for this specific case. We start with the count equal with 0. As long as the count is less than 100, we print out the message welcome to Java. We increment the count with 1, and we return back to check the count. We follow the arrows that we have basically in the flowchart, and we execute the program for this specific uh, code. So if we trace that program, I actually only, will only trace it up to as long as the count is less than 2. We start by initializing the count to 0. Then we compare that is 0 less than 2. That's true. So we print welcome to Java. We increment the count to 1, from 0 to 1. We again check the condition. Is the count 1 strictly less than 2? Yes, it's still true. 1 is less than 2. We print again the second time, welcome to Java. We increment the count with 1, which basically makes the count now equal with 2. And 2 strictly less than 2 is false. So then we exit the loop by uh, basically up to now we printed twice, welcome to Java. One thing that you may notice is the fact that we initialize the counter with 0, and we are using strictly less than uh, the number of steps that we actually want to execute. The reason for that is that both arrays and strings use as the index of the first element, either a character or the element of the array, uh, the index 0. So it's common in programming languages that usually if you want to iterate n times, you start with the loop iteration uh, variable like count or i equal with 0, and you are using strictly less than the number of steps that you actually want to uh, perform the body of the loop. So it's common for any programming language in general that uh, we start from zero to the length of the, the structure, uh, uh, strictly less than the length of the structure. Usually it's if it's an array or if it's a string, up to the length minus one as the index of the last element. And again, we'll actually see the reason for that uh, and the reason why we actually have that in arrays and in strings is that the first element usually has an offset of zero uh, bytes from the address of the actual uh, object, so from the reference of that string or the reference of that array, the address of that array. So we actually start what, by identifying the first element with the index zero and the last element with the index the length of the data structure minus one. 
So it's common that we start counting from zero instead of counting from one. There are a few caution notes about uh, comparisons for reals, the use of semicolon after a statement, and the fact that we can actually have multiple statements within uh, the condition or within the body of the loop. So I will cover these caution notes after we actually take a break to respond to the questions in the chat. So let's see if there are any questions by now. Uh, there were a lot of questions. And I will respond to the questions probably in reverse order because it's easier to follow them. So the first question is by Dave Chen. It's about the uh, midterm next week. Uh, is next me next uh, lecture the next Tuesday's lecture covered in the midterm? Uh, I think the answer to that is no. Uh, we should finish the material that is required for the midterm this week. So for the midterm, we are going to cover, as we see in the lecture notes loops, methods, arrays, and multidimensional arrays. These are all the chapters that we actually require for the midterm. We are going to start to talk about objects and object-oriented programming uh, next Tuesday, but that is not required for the midterm. All the homeworks that actually uh, have material uh, uh, important for the midterm are already posted and uh, they are due before the midterm, in fact. So do homework, uh, the homework uh, on uh, basically arrays and uh, uh, loops and methods. This is a homework that was posted today and is due uh, one week from now. Uh, the meter we only cover material up to multidimensional arrays included. Let's see what other questions will be there. Are there? Uh, will the meter be a written exam? Yes, the midterm is in person uh, in Frey Hall, room 104, I believe. I think there is a, yes, Frey Hall 104. And uh, that is in person for two hours at Stony Brook University. It's posted in uh, the solar when you registered in, to the class. Uh, how is the format of the test? Uh, there will be 10 questions, each value 10 points. There will be a sample exam posted on uh, Piazza uh, this week, and we are going actually to go over that sample exam during the lecture next Tuesday. You can actually try to solve the problems in that sample exam. It will be posted both with and without solutions, and the midterm basically follows same kind of questions with the sample exam. I think those are all the questions that I see in the chat for now. So let's continue with the lecture. So there is a caution that you have to be very careful about the quality of uh, with reals. The, the answer is do not ever use strict equality when you're checking in a loop uh, if values are actually equal in a real value. Uh, and the reason for that is that internally any kind of uh, reals are actually stored in a, a representation where we are using powers of two or basically negative powers of two to represent that specific uh, value. And one value that seems obvious for many uh, non-programmers that could be represented easily in a, a computer location is 0 0.1. 0 0.1 is actually not represented exactly. If you assign 0 0.1 to any variable in uh, Java, Python, or other uh, languages, the, the internal representation of that 0 0.1 is actually 1 divided by 16 plus 1 divided by 32 plus 1 divided by 256 and so on up to the length of that specific real that uh, type that is basically represented in memory. So for instance, uh, this uh, a representation for float would use 4 bytes or basically uh, uh, 32 bits to store that specific value. 
and a double would use 64 bits or 8 bytes to store that value. But although this value is very close to 0 0.1, it is not in fact 0 0.1. It's very close, there is an approximation, it's what can be represented on those 8 bytes in this binary representation, or what can be represented on 4 bytes for a float for this binary representation. So the value of 0 0.1 is not exactly 0 0.1. It's very close to 0 0.1, but it's not 0 0.1. So for instance, although for a non-programmer, this loop would actually make sense. We are, uh, we are starting with an item that is equal with 1, with a sum that is equal with 0, and then we are comparing if the item is different than 0. At each step, we increment the sum with the item, and we decrement the item with, minor, with uh, 0 0.1. We basically want to compute the sum uh, that is represented here. We start with the item is 1, we increment the sum with that item, so it's 1, then we have 0 0.9, then we have 0 0.8, and so on up to 0 0.1. One would expect that the moment that we subtract from 0 0.1, 0 0.1, we get an absolute zero, and absolute zero is different than actual zero uh, in uh, in integer zero. However, that's actually not true, because 0, 0.0, after we actually compute this sum, uh, this uh, subtraction is not in fact 0, 0.0, because from 1 we subtracted all of these approximations of 0, 0.1. 0, 0.1 is not stored exactly in memory, so we will get an epsilon value, a double value, very close to 0 0.1, but not 0, uh, it's very close to 0, 0, but it's not 0, exactly 0 as an integer. 0 as an integer really means 0 point, an infinite number of zeros. It's absolute 0. While this item is 0 0.00000 and 1 bit after many, many zeros uh, that can be represented on this double value is actually different than 0. So 0, 0.0, or that value that is it's close to 0, 0.0, is different than 0. So since it's different than 0, we will keep summing the item to the sum, and we now decrement 0, 0.0 with 0, 0.1, and we keep decrementing, getting bigger and bigger negative numbers or basically smaller and smaller numbers. But we will never actually finish. This is this loop is actually an infinite loop. We started from 1, we subtracted 0 or approximately 0 0.1 every time the loop was executed, and but the loop does not terminate for exactly 0, because the value is very close to 0, but not 0. So what do you think that is the solution for solving this problem? So I see that uh, there is no response yet in the chat. Uh, the solution is not that complicated. We basically, one could use greater than equal with zero. So now this will actually execute properly for every value that is greater than equal with zero. It's true that the sum itself is not extremely exact. It's not going to be exactly 1 plus 0 0.9 plus 0 0.8. Uh, all of them are approximations for the actual value, because the value that we are subtracting at every step, 0 0.1, is not exactly 0 0.1. It's 0 0.1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, and then a value different than 0. This is just an approximation of 0 0.1. There are other types in Java, one that is called big decimal, that can represent exactly, internally, in fact, as a string, any real number as long as it if it's finite. So you can actually represent up to, uh, let's say, a billion digits after the decimal point, 1 divided by 3, which is 0 0.33333 and so on. But you have to specify a limit. So that limit you have to actually specify that I want to keep this many digits after the decimal point. You cannot represent infinite number of digits after the decimal point. 
Another caution that we will see in a couple of seconds is the fact that you should not put a semicolon at after a condition, after a while condition. We'll see it in a couple of seconds after we cover the other two types of loops. The second type of loop after while loops is the do while loop or loops in which the check for the continuation of the loop is actually at the end of the loop, not at the beginning of the loop. So we always start by executing the loop body at least once. And then based on the value of this condition, if the value of this while condition is true, we actually execute again the loop and then we check again the condition. If the value of the condition is false, we exit the loop. So other programming languages have other types of uh, conditions of, or loops which basically uh, exit on true and stay within the loop on false. Like for instance, C has repeat until. Repeat some uh, body until the condition becomes true. However, Java only has do while loops, which execute the loop while the condition is true. It, ex it exits this loop the moment that the condition becomes false. So why are, what are these used for? They are used for loops that execute at least once. For instance, a game menu. You remember there were the old games written in the console, but that's not actually... Uh, quite true, there are newer games that always print the menu uh, once, even if you're not playing the game, uh, you will have to enter, uh, exit, or click on a bu button to exit. So any kind of such menus, we would actually do a do while loop. So do uh, some body of the condition, like printing a menu that uh, we would uh, uh, require the user to enter P for printing the counter, or Q for quitting and then reading the input from the user and checking if that input equals with P for printing the counter and also incrementing the counter with one while the condition uh, inside the while loop is true. And for the condition inside the while loop, I'm actually using the negation operator. So in fact, my condition is that as long as the selection in uppercase is not equal with the letter Q, we continue executing the do while loop. The moment that my, the, the letter that we enter is in uppercase, the letter, the upper letter Q, we actually, the condition becomes true, but the negation of that condition becomes false and we exit the loop. So when the user enters a Q, the condition that is actually a negation becomes false and we exit the loop, we say goodbye, and we exit the program. So for any program that you would want to execute uh, the body uh, of the loop should execute at least once, we would use a do while loop. There is a very easy way to transform a do while loop into a while statement. Basically what we can do is to repeat the statements that we have in the do while loop before the loop itself and then to use a while loop for uh, instead of a do while loop. That will actually also print the, mess, the menu at least once and execute uh, the condition or evaluate the condition right afterwards. An example for that program that we actually had before would be this one. Basically we start the program and it prints once, at least once, uh, the options of the menu like enter P for printing the counter, enter Q for quitting. Let's say that the user enters P, then we print the counter, the original counter was 0, and the new variable for counter gets incremented with 1, and then we return back and we execute again the, the dual loop body, which actually prints again the menu, and let's say that the user enters an option that is not print or quit, so that basically will not affect neither the uh, printing, uh, the if statement within the do while loop or the while loop itself. Uh, then we execute the loop again. Again, it will print the menu. Uh, we are going to enter P this time again, and it will execute the if statement within the do while loop. And we continue printing again the menu until the user finally enters Q. 
the moment that the user enters Q, the selection, the Q in uppercase is equal with Q, the condition becomes true, but the negation of that condition is false, so we exit and we basically uh, print goodbye and we exit the program. The last uh, for loop that uh, the last loop statement that we are going to talk about today uh, in this lecture is for loops. So for loops are good for iterations when we actually know the number of times that the variable that we iterate over uh, gets incremented. Basically, what's the range of that variable? Now that's not totally true because any while statement can actually be written as a for loop and vice versa, every for loop can be rewritten easily as a while statement. The condition is usually the same, but for loops are preferred for iterating over collections. Basically, starting with an initial value that is initialized in the initial action for some variable, then checking the loop continuation condition. If that condition is true, we execute the loop body, the statement in the loop body, and then we return and we execute the action after each iteration, which usually it's an increment of the loop variable, but it could be any statement in Java, in fact. It could be a print statement, uh, which contains a post-increment operation within an expression. So here we have the flowchart for this specific uh, uh, pseudocode for the general version of for loops. First, we execute the initial action, which is an assignment in more general cases of uh, a start value to a variable. Then we check the condition, the loop continuation condition. If that condition is true, then we execute the statement within the loop body. And then we execute the action after each iteration, followed by checking again the condition. If the condition is false, we exit the for loop. Basically, we continue with the next statement after the for loop. So the same program that we wrote with a while loop before, we can write with a for loop. We can define an integer i. It is common that you actually can define that integer i within the, the for loop itself. Uh, then we assign to the, to the variable i 0, as long as i is less than 100. We print a message, welcome to Java, followed by incrementing i and checking the condition again. So what happens in this case is exactly the same as we had in the case of while statement. We start with i equal with 0, 0 less than 100 is true. Then we print out the, wel the message, welcome to Java, and we increment i to 1. Then we check again the condition. Is 1 less than 100? That's still true. We ex again execute the body of that loop statement. Basically, we print welcome to Java. We increment i to 2. And we check if 2 is less than 100. And the process continues. Let's see what happens when we get to i equal with 99. 99 less than 100 is true. So we uh, print the message, welcome to Java. We increment i to 100. 100 is strictly less than 100 is false. And we exit the for loop. For loops are very useful for counting. They are popular for iterating over a string, character by character, because the indices start from 0. And, it, and basically, we iterate as long as the condition says that the index is less than the length of the string. Uh, we can iterate through the indices of an array later when we are going to learn about arrays. Basically, it allows us to access every element of the collection. Or we can implement with for loops algorithms. For instance, we, later uh, this semester, we are going to implement linear search. That's the simplest algorithm. We iterate from the beginning of the array up to the end, end of the array in uh, position by position to basically check if the element that you are looking for, called the key, is equal with the element in the array. And we return, basically, we print the, the index where we found that element. And other algorithms. The, as algorithms become uh, more complex, we are going to use, uh, basically, more for loops instead of 
other types of loops to iterate over uh, some collection a number of times. Good algorithms require a number of iterations. Uh, Basically, we'll actually write inner or nested for loops that for every, let's say, element in the array or in the collection does several operations. Like, for instance, comparing it with other values or other elements of an array. These are called counter-controlled uh, loops because we start with a counter from zero and we iterate. Basically, we execute the loop as long as some Boolean condition is true. So let's trace an, an easy uh, for loop. So in this for loop, we start with i equal with 0. That is initialized in the action for initial condition. 0 less than 2 is true. We print out the message, welcome to Java. We increment i with 1. i is now 1. 1 less than 2 is true. We print out the message, welcome to Java. We increment i to 2. And the condition becomes false. Therefore, we actually executed a loop exactly two times. So that's why I said it's common that we start from zero, but we actually check that the condition is strictly less than the upper limit. That will give us exactly the number of steps of elements in the list or in the, in the collection. The initial action for four loops can actually be a list of zero or, zero or more comma-separated expressions. So if we have, for instance, uh, 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 two indices, basically to iterate over i and j, and we want to iterate over these indices in parallel, like for instance, we start with both equal with zero, and then the action after each iteration in a for loop can be also a list of zero or more comma-separated statements. So in fact, we can increment both i and j in the same step. In addition to that, we can actually have any kind of statement that we want in the action after each iteration. So, for instance, this is totally correct to iterate over, let's say, integers from 1 to 100 and printing out the value of the integer and incrementing the integer with 1. So, a print statement within the action for each iteration is accepted. It basically specifies that these are a sequence of statements uh, that are executed. Um, one other thing that you may notice in this same slide is the fact that uh, you can actually end any loop with the no operation statement. Semicolon, if you put it right after the condition, it, it's basically a statement. So it's very common that actually people make errors by putting semicolon uh, since it's required after each statement in Java right after the condition instead of actually executing the body of the loop and then putting semicolon. Which actually brings us to the next uh, uh, point that we can write infinite loops. By default, the loop continuation condition is vacuously true. There is nothing to actually check, so it's implicitly true. So for instance, if you write to, uh, want to write an infinite loop, you can actually write a for loop with no initial action, no condition, and no post action which is basically equivalent with a while, as long as it's true, do the same body of the loop condition. In this example, we see that this is actually done for infinite loops. Now, there are two ways to actually uh, solve this. One is with a break statement, a statement that actually allows us to exit the loop at any point, or we continue the loop with a continuous statement, or we have a system.exit within some if statement or conditional statement within the loop body itself. Or we have a return statement for methods within the body of the loop. And we are going to see that uh, in, when we talk about methods. But it's totally correct and in fact is used for a lot of servers like web servers, email servers to actually uh, execute an infinite loop within that server. So what basically this does, it waits for input from the user. We are checking infinitely, is there an input from the user? If it is, we actually execute the body and 
in most cases we spawn a different thread that takes care of that user basically responds to the uh, to the queries that that user puts again there is a, a note of ca uh, caution that adding a semicolon at the end of any clause any loop before the body is actually a common mistake and the biggest problem is that this is actually a logical error so for instance in this example we are actually quite uh, uh, in, in trouble and the reason why is that we actually have a no operation statement that gets executed 10 times and then we are printing only once the value of i and in case that i was actually defined not within the for statement but maybe before the for statement we are really in trouble because we basically have some output that gets printed for i but really there shouldn't be anything printed for i because uh, or it should be much more it should be the number of steps of that for loop so it is very uh, uh, problematic because it doesn't occur as a, a compiler error in this case it, it would occur if the variable i would be defined in the for statement but in this case it would not occur as a logical error and we would get incorrect results basically the program would print only once the value of i the same applies for semicolon at the end of while statement basically the same is a mistake only that in this case it's actually a little bit better situation because the program will hang at that location so it will never get to execute anything but the infinite number of, of no operation statements because this condition is always true as long as i is less than 10 and i was 0 0 less than 10 execute nothing return back 0 less than 10 execute nothing return back this is infinite we are not cha uh, changing any value in memory this will basically be a process that r doesn't really do anything it runs into an infinite loop so the easy way to solve all of this is to actually use the other style the preferred style of java programs where we put the beginning of the block for any kind of loop statements uh, inside or right after the condition for the while loop. So if we put on open parenthesis, open curly brace here, we would be uh, not putting semicolon that it basically run this into an infinite loop. Also, also a note of caution is that the for loop already has an increment as the action after each iteration. So be very careful not to update the counting twice. Uh, if you translate while loops into for loops, it's quite common the case that you would write a for loop that contains an action after each iteration that increments the value of y. But uh, since inside the while statement that you had before, you had a, a increment statement, explicit increment statement inside the loop itself, you would basically increment the value of j twice instead of one before we continue with what type of loops you should use uh, which in fact is a matter of personal preference uh, let's see if there are any questions in the chat and i will also take the time to uh, make the current uh, teaching assistants also hosts for today's lecture next time it would be advisable that the teaching assistants join us at the beginning of the class. Thank you. Any questions? Okay, so now I think I added all the TAs, all the teaching assistants for this class. So I see one question from uh, uh, Nadifa that I haven't responded to yet. 
uh, we have class after the exam should we use uh, the library to log in um, since the so yes uh, the answer is you can actually uh, use the library if you have a pair of headphones uh, but you can also watch the lecture uh, after the, the class on YouTube or SD Connect. So I will be recording it and then you can uh, play it from YouTube or SD Connect and uh, uh, the lab, do the lab for the day. Uh, the lab is due at the end of the day. Uh, we can make an exception in fact in the case of uh, the lab uh, right after the midterm we can make it due at the end of the next uh, business day or uh, at the beginning of the weekend. So basically you can watch the lectures that I will record if you don't have any other uh, option to watch the lectures in the library. Uh, I believe that the main reading room is open but you will need a pair of headphones since the lecture is online and you don't want to uh, disturb other people. That be sitting around. Any questions? Okay. So let's actually go over the types of loops and also as part of the lecture today I will actually uh, solve some of the problems in the lab. So you can actually start with uh, using loops right today after the class uh, during the lab. And as I said, the next, the following homework after the one that was posted today is actually my programming lab. So you should actually solve what is required up to now in my programming lab, beside the fact that uh, some of the problems in the midterm are selected from my programming lab. So if you want basically what type of problems can appear in the midterm, uh, the type of problems in the, uh, my programming lab. So it's a matter of uh, personal preference which loop you should use, while loops versus for loops, for loops versus do while loops and so on. In fact, they are equally uh, e expressive. Everything that you can express in either one of these types of loops, you can represent in the other types of loops. And here we have the most common cases of rewriting loops. If you have a while statement, you can just write it syntactically into a for statement. The initial action is empty and the post condition is empty. And now we have a for statement that implements exactly the same thing that the while statement implemented. Basically, it checks the condition before entering in the block and uh, it does this check out be, uh, before entering every time inside the inner block. There is an expectation that you are modifying, uh, incrementing a, a variable within that loop body, but that is really up to you because if the loop body was correct in the case of the while statement, it will still be correct in the case of the for statement. Now, if we have four loops, they can also, also be rewritten in a syntactical way into a semantical equivalent uh, a, a set of statements. So the initial action of the for statement becomes a statement in itself. The condition is part of a while statement. We execute the body of that loop and after executing each loop, we actually do the action after each iteration as a statement. So we can take any for loop and rewrite it into a while loop that uh, actually does exactly the same code that we had in the case of the for loop. And there are also rewriting, manual rewriting mechanisms for do while loops into for loops and uh, while loops and vice versa. Another way to uh, exit a loop is actually to use what is called a Boolean loop control flag. So a flag is usually a Boolean variable, like in our example, the more work flag, that it is initialized to true before we enter the loop, so we can actually succeed for the first time that we call this program if the value of, my, uh, of the flag is equal with true. You may have other code, like for instance, defining the factorial for 0 and 1 equal with 1. 
while the more work flag is on, while that condition is true, factorial is multiplied with n and n is decremented with 1. After which we have an if statement. If the value of n comes 1, which is basically we have a reverse loop that goes back from the value original value of n, like let's say 5, back to 1. If the value of n becomes 1, more work is equal with false, is assigned false, and therefore the condition of the while loop is false and we exit the while loop. So the flag is really used as this loop continuation condition. Inside the loop, we actually test the flag for the ending condition or we test for the ending condition and when that condition is it's on, it's true, uh, we turn the flag off. Basically, we uh, turn the more work flag to false, which basically once it's turned off uh, in the next iteration, we exit the while loop. So common algorithms that we write with loops, let's say that before we actually get into arrays, we would like to compute the sum of the first n integers. Uh, so here we have an example. We start with an outer variable sum. And the reason for that is that it may be, uh, we actually need the same variable to be incremented inside the loop as many times as basically the loop iterates through the body. We can't assign the value 0 to the sum within the for loop because that will actually uh, keep the sum to the last sum. Is not actually uh, what we would like to have. It will initialize to zero after each step of iteration. So in this example, uh, within the loop body, which basically defines where that we iterate from one to four, not included, uh, we increment the sum variable with the value of i. So for i equals zero, the sum variable is equal with zero. Uh, for the value of i equal 1, which is the first step, in fact, uh, sum is incremented with 1, and 1 less than 4 is true. So we increment the sum with, with the value of i, 1, and then we increment i, we execute the action after each iteration, we increment i with 1. Then we again execute the body of this loop. So uh, 1 is less than 4 or 2 is less than 4 is true, therefore the sum is incremented with 2. And this process continues until we reach uh, uh, i is equal with 4. 4 less than equal with 4 is true, we increment the sum with 4, and then uh, i becomes 5. 5 less than 4 is false, and we exit the loop. Now let's assume that we have two iterations. Like for instance, the simplest uh, program would be to print a matrix, which prints uh, initially the numbers from 1 to 10. Then it will print uh, every one of those elements multiplied with the value of i, which is 2. Then we print every one of those elements uh, up to the value of i, which is 3. And the, pro uh, the, the, the product continues until we basically reach i is equal with 11 and we exit the outer loop. So this program will actually print for every line between 1 and 10 the elements within that line. But to print the elements within that line, we also use an inner loop, a loop nested within the outer loop, which for every value of i, for every value of the row number, it prints 10 uh, uh, values of elements. Basically, uh, i multiply with j uh, for every j from 1 to 10. So a program like this one would actually print a matrix. Uh, 1 to 10, then 2 to 20, 3 to 30, and so on. So let's actually do this in Java. I recommend that for every program that you find in my, my code, you would uh, try to actually implement it in Java from scratch and see how it works. Put breakpoints at the beginning of the code, uh, use blocks and all of that to actually see the output of, uh, of the program itself and see why it does what it does. So in our case, we actually iterate 
10, over 10 rows. For every row, we iterate with another variable, let's call it j, over the row 10 times. And the action after each iteration is incrementing j with 1. Then we print the value of uh, i multiplied with j. And I'm going to uh, compute it on the spot within the system.outprint statement. So I will actually multiply i with j and then add a space without having to define a separate variable product that takes the value of i multiplied with j and uh, then it basically prints it. So one other thing that we would like to have is at the end of each row, we would like to have a print ln statement, which basically prints a, a string at the end of the row. There is one typo in our program. We have semicolon there. So if we run this program, it will basically print our matrix with uh, the numbers from 1 to 10 multiplied with the row number. So in this case, it would be 1 to 10, 2 to 20, 3 to 30, and so on. Again, if you want to put a breakpoint and see how this executes, you should double click next to the row that you want to stop at and then start the debugger. Uh, I respond to the debugger that when I start the debugger, it goes directly to the debug uh, perspective, which basically has the default, uh, is the default perspective that we can actually execute line by line the code. And you see that for i equal 1, it executes the value of j 10 times. So for every i, actually print 10 times before exiting. And the moment that we exit, it, it prints a new line, and it increments i uh, with 1, and then again executes 10 times the inner block, the part of the inner code. Now, one thing that is not extremely efficient is the fact that we are defining j every time within the outer loop. So it's preferable that we actually uh, don't, redefine, don't define variables within loops, because it takes time to define, declare, basically, the variable again, allocate space for it in memory for every variable that gets created. So it's common that we define the variables for the inner loops outside before we actually execute the, the, the part of the inner loop. So in this case, I'm going to stop the debugger. And we can rerun the program to see that the output is exactly the same Nothing got changed by me declaring the value of j outside. Now, what are these variables? These are called local variables. If we define j within the for loop, it's available only within that for loop. It's not available within the rest of the program. It's like defining a variable within an inner block. If we have, let's say, a block of code here, and in this block of code we define a new variable k, the variable k disappears the moment that we finish the inner block. The same applies for for loops. If we had a variable j defined right before the for loop, that program would still be correct but inefficient. Because for every value of i, j will disappear the moment that we finish the block for the for loop, and we would have to redefine that variable j. So these are called local variables. A local variable declared inside any block is known only inside that block. It's local to the block and it will be basically deleted the moment that the block finishes. The, the, the variable will disappear. We cannot use it in computing expressions, in assigning values to it and so on. References to it outside the block will basically uh, cause compiler errors, which are still better than runtime errors because we are the end, basically, user that actually sees uh, the compiler errors, but our customers would be the actual users 
that will see runtime errors that basically program crash and that gives a bad impression for users of, uh, of computer science. Now this includes the local variables includes those variables that are defined within the init field for for loops. So if we define an integer variable i within the init field of for loops, the moment that we act, first of all, this i is like a variable declared outside the for loop for the intention of uh, the block inside the for loop. So the same variable we will use at, the same, at uh, all iterations. Basically, we started with, let's say, a value for i. Uh, next time we increment i, we don't redefine i, we just increment, uh, we assign a new value to that variable, the local variable. However, once we finish the for loop, uh, we are at some statement outside the for loop, those variables are not available anymore. They were only available within the for loop. So in our case, after we finish our for loop, this integer variable i does not exist anymore. The moment that we finish the for loop, the variable was garbage collected by the system and we lost the reference to it. We lost its uh, uh, address. Do not declare variables inside loops. It takes time during execution to create and destroy variables and you are, you are doing it repetitively. So in like, in, like in my example, define the variable j that is used for uh, the inner loop outside the outer loop. That basically avoids creating the same variable multiple times, the number of iterations of the loop. Now, before we continue with two keywords that are useful, very useful, for actually breaking the execution of a loop, let's see if we have any questions in the chat. So if you have any questions, please post them in the chat and we are going to respond to those questions. Otherwise, we are going to learn about break and continue statements and then we are going to move on to methods. Okay. Okay, so how can we use breaks in a loop to immediately terminate the loop? Let's assume that we have a loop but we don't exactly know the number of steps that we have to iterate through these loops. Basically, what we want is to start from number equal with 0, increment the number with 1, so 0 plus 1, then 1 plus 2, uh, uh, 1 plus 2 plus 3, uh, 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4, and this process continues up to when, let's say, an out, uh, variable sum becomes greater than or equal with 100. So we don't exactly know the number of steps. We actually know when should we exit out of some condition. For that, we can use a break statement. A break statement would, less, would let us break a while statement or any kind of loop, as a matter of fact. We can exit the statement the moment that some condition becomes true. So in our case, the moment that the increment will make the sum greater than 100, we would like to exit. We don't want to actually keep incrementing and, and uh, uh, modifying the sum. We actually want the first sum that is greater than or equal with 100. For that, we can use a break statement. Break, break is a keyword in Java, is a reserved, key, uh, reserved word. The meaning of that is that if the break is put within a block, and that block must be a loop block because we can put also a block inside the if statement, but break actually works on loops. Uh, break will exit immediately the loop. Basically, we'll continue with the next statement after the loop terminates. So break is a special uh, type of jump. is a jump that jumps directly to the condition of the loop. And at that point, we basically exit the, prog the loop itself. Continue is another keyword. If you are using it within a loop, it ends the current iteration and the program control goes back to the end of the loop body. And then continues the loop. So again, we check the condition. 
the loop continuation condition and we may actually execute uh, the other statements within that uh, program. So let's assume that we want to add the integers from 1 to 20 except 10 and 11. So what we can do is we actually have a loop that iterates from number equal with 0, increments the number with 1. And if the number is equal either with 10 or with 11, then we would like to jump to the end of the loop. That basically means do not sum the, do not add the number to the current sum. So continue is very similar in some respect to break, but it's not equivalent. Break is actually jumps to the end of the loop and exits. Uh, continue jumps to the end of the loop, and now we are still in the loop. So we go back to, to execute the condition of that specific loop. Okay. So as I promised at the beginning, let's do some of the laps for today before we actually uh, stop the recording. So the lab for today, many of the problems in the lab for today, like for instance the one that it's about kilograms to pounds table, requires that we iterate a number of times, maybe a uh, hundred times starting from one with a step of two up to 199 to print the value of uh, the number of kilograms that we have in the first column with the number of pounds uh, equal or corresponding to that number of kilograms. And of course, you can actually write a, a, a long sequence of print statements, in fact, about a hundred of them, to print these values by computing them manually or computing them uh, by basically uh, applying the definition recursively. But we can actually do the same thing with a loop. So let's implement the kilograms to pounds table program. So we are going to create a new class, kilograms to points table. And in our program, first we print the number of kilograms and then the number of pounds. So we'll start the program by printing that header of the table, system.all.println. Uh, kilograms followed by a tab uh, slash t followed by pounds. At any point in the program we can actually print to see what's the output. So in this case it prints kilograms followed by tab followed by pounds. And now we can write our loop. For every integer i starting with 1 as long as i is less than 200, that's the last value, and i is incremented with 2 at every step. This you basically specify through a statement was the uh, increment for i at every step. We are going to print, let's use a block, we don't really need to, system.out.println, the value of kilograms, which is the value of i, followed by a tab, followed by the corresponding values in value in pounds, which is i multiplied with 2.2. And let's see what happens. Basically, we printed that table. The only problem is that we print multiple digits after the decimal point. I told you earlier, these are all approximations. You see that you have 85.8, up to 1. So you need either to round these values, or we can use a printf statement. Earlier this semester, we learned printf. Let's basically state that we want to print a digit followed by a tab, followed by a floating point number with two digits after the decimal point. And then we can give the argument. It's i and i multiplied with 2.2. So now if we run our program, uh, let's also print the new line character, 
after each row because now we are using printf and printf does not have uh, uh, basically a statement that uh, prints also a new line after each iteration and here we have our program. If we only want one digit after the decimal point we can transform this 2 into a 1 and now we get exactly the table that is required in the lecture notes. Uh, I use tabs, but you can actually put additional tabs if you want the, the outputs to be aligned correctly. So I did just put an additional tab, and now you can see that pounds and kilograms are aligned at the same row. Let's do another problem from the homework. A more complicated problem is actually to print two tables in parallel with each other, kilograms to pounds, and then pounds to kilograms, and this must be in two tables. We start with the number of kilograms 1 up to 200, and we start with the number of pounds 20 up to 515. We basically add 5 for every new pound that is added to the system. And I'm going to use, in fact, the same program that we had before. So we would define a second variable, let's say j, that is equal with 20. And this is these are both defined in the initial condition for this, uh, for this for loop. Now, at every step, we increment j with 5. The condition stays the same, with the exception that we don't print a new line after the print statement. We print the next output. Using a printf statement. So let's see, we need to print the decimal value followed by two tabs, followed by the floating point value. In the header, we should actually add additional outputs. We also convert from pounds to kilos. And for every value from uh, 0 to, uh, from 1 to 200, we print that followed by two tabs, followed by, again, the same thing that we had before. Basically, for every integer was the corresponding value in kilo, for every pound, what uh, value was the corresponding value in uh, kilograms? So now we also add j, and for every j, we add j divided with 2.2. Okay. Okay, let's see the output. No, we haven't put a new line character at the end of each row. Now let's see the output. Okay. We need just normal tabs, not escaping the tabs. And here we have the output. So you see that we start with 20 pounds and we transform them to kilos, and we start with 25 pounds and transform them to kilos and so on. Okay. Uh, any questions? Yes, it's it's fine to use math.round. Yes, yes, of course. Okay. If you do get an error, then probably you didn't copy the code exactly the same. So, in order to help you, I believe that I could post this on Piazza. Let's call it tab 3, screen tab. And let's actually put it into code. That will basically do that example for, uh, for basically printing the values of those numbers. 
uh, J stops when I stops. Why? Because basically the condition is true as long as I is less than 200. And the moment that I becomes uh, greater than 200 or not less, treating less than 200, also the, the entire loop terminates. So we don't need two conditions. Uh, we could have had two conditions that basically use conjunction to actually create one condition, but we don't need to because the same number, if you look in the table that we printed, the number of times that we printed i, we actually print j in parallel. We finish when j becomes 515 and that's it. There is no more lines that will be printed afterwards. So we finish at that point. So at this point, let's actually save the lecture notes, so the video, so basically everybody can actually read it uh, later today. And I would like to uh, ask the TAs not to uh, resize the chat or any other uh, setting 